There's a new generation of millennials. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to this afternoon's uh, Department of Medicine meeting. Um, our speaker this afternoon is Peter Rabenheimer. I'm sure everybody knows Peter as, as uh, the head of general internal medicine at Kroniskia and at UCT, and also a specialist uh, endocrinologist. And uh, Peter's going to be speaking on the, on the topic of diagnostic reasoning. Um, and this is an activity that we're obviously involved in every day. Uh, in the wards of the clinic or, or the emergency room. Um, but we seldom uh, kind of take a step back and reflect on the theory behind it and um, how we, we conduct uh, diagnostic reasoning as, as a cognitive process and how we might improve our, our diagnostic reasoning and avoid errors. And I heard uh, Peter give a talk on this topic uh, a few years ago at one of the Friday morning meetings and it was really excellent uh, talk and um, have invited Peter to speak on this topic again today and really excited uh, to hear his, his presentation on this and, and uh, hopefully have a discussion at, at the end of the session uh, on other people's views on, on this topic of diagnostic reasoning. So uh, Peter's uh, talk this afternoon is entitled The Rational, Rational Diagnostician Achieving Diagnostic Excellence in Clinical Medicine. Uh, thanks very much, Peter, for, for the talk this afternoon, and over to you. Thanks very much, Graham, and, and hi, everyone. Right. So, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, trying to focus really on, on three areas, rational, uh, using reasoning or logic, it's about cognition and about thinking. Um, I'm going to focus um, on diagnostic reasoning as a component of clinical reasoning. Uh, and then when we talk about excellence, um, we're not really talking about um, that specialist consultant who you all always remember for his special art of making a diagnosis. Nowadays, I'm afraid, uh, for better or for worse, we're really talking about a lack of error. And I'm going to touch on that as well. Um, something I guess that's always bothered me is that there seems to be a gap between sort of doing uh, and teaching of reasoning. Um, all, all of us do reasoning every day, and, and we seem to assume that teaching clinical reasoning is simply part of everyday work on the wards or, or clinics. Um, but I think teaching what we do is hard unless we have the vocabulary to describe it. We know the processes uh, and we're okay at being vulnerable in front of others. Um, more than that, I actually think sometimes the way we teach students contribute to deficiencies in clinical reasoning, the, the, the systems approach we teach, the, we don't always differentiate between common and, and sometimes more sexy uncommon diseases. Uh, and uh, I think assumptions are very often made that students can um, learn simply by watching and can recognize more important problems. And I don't think that's true. And so that's very much the background of this sort of talk. Um, and, and it's directed um, at clinical teachers. Um, clinical teachers need to understand their own clinical reasoning process, as well as be able to convey that knowledge to their trainees. At the same time, they need to understand the developmental stages of clinical reasoning and be able to nurture each trainee's own expertise. Um, you know, clinical teachers can promote the development of reasoning while simultaneously diagnosing the patient's disorder and the student's abilities. Um, and the way we improve our one's own diagnostic skills is really the same. If we have insight into process and we master teaching, we become better diagnosticians ourselves. So, so I hope this talk will have something for everyone. Um, no doubt I'm directing quite a bit at the medical student to break down the framework of how that works. I, I presume they're going to watch on YouTube. Um, I don't see them here. Um, all of those fourth years on my wards, I, I don't see your name here. Uh, and, and to the expert diagnosticians and teachers, um, the, the rest of us, who perhaps haven't thought about this uh, in the same way. So, so what is clinical reasoning and why is it important? Um, it describes the thinking and the decision-making processes associated with clinical practice. And, and it's really the process where a clinician applies reasoning 
in combination with the clinician's knowledge and skills. Uh, and it's a clinician's ability to make decisions based on the available clinical information that includes a history, a clinical examination, and sometimes test results. And this is often against the backdrop of clinical uncertainty. Uh, and in addition, we now include that clinical reasoning includes formulating and communicating these effectively with a patient or their carers, an important component of that. Uh, and there's a curriculum um, here proposed by a consensus statement in the UK, what they call the UK Clinical Reasoning in Medical Education Statement Group, uh, just trying to see what concepts need to be covered in training. Um, and it's helpful for you to think about whether these are the concepts you yourself as a clinician or teacher have thought about. Clinical reasoning concepts, which I'm covering today, the history and physical examination, our bread and butter, we certainly do that. Problem identification and management, choosing and interpreting diagnostic tests and shared decision making, again, uh, coming in there. Uh, and um, clinical reasoning can probably broadly be, be classified into diagnostic reasoning, which I'm going to discuss today which is largely correct or incorrect, although there's uncertainty. And, and management reasoning is, is different. It's negotiating a management and an appropriate monitoring for treatment response. And there are many reasonable options there. Uh, in fact, sometimes even more difficult. So if we focus on the process of diagnostic reasoning, very simply, it's from the patient's symptoms, my head is pounding, to the clinician making a diagnosis. Uh, and we connect book knowledge about diseases, um, and in fact, previous information that you've obtained from your experience of the, the patients you've seen, together with information that you obtained from your patients with or without tests, uh, and we reason such as we reach a diagnosis and treatment. And there are, there are key elements uh, in clinical reasoning. Uh, the patient's story um, is a big focus that I'm going to discuss, data acquisition, an accurate problem representation. We generate a hypothesis and then we search for and select an illness script. Again, I'm using the vocabulary deliberately and we'll see it defined as we go through uh, to reach a diagnosis. And it's an iterative process where, where we then you know, may need to gain more data, whether it's repeating history, going back to an examination or doing more tests to reach that diagnosis. Uh, and and this, this whole process is affected by our knowledge, of course, but not only by that, by the context in which we work and our experience very much hugely so. Why is it important? Well, as a physician, of course, we can say that diagnosis is the most critical of a physician's skills. It's every doctor's measure of his abilities. It's the most important ingredient in his professional self-image. Um, uh, and as a diagnostician, Sherlock Holmes uh, probably said it best. He said, I cannot live without brain work. What else is there to live with? Uh, but I'm afraid it's also important um, because you may be surprised that diagnosis is incorrect in 10 to 15% of the time. 85% of diagnostic errors are considered preventable and serious disability results from up to 50% of cases of diagnostic error. Uh, in this very large um, claims database of patients who died in the U US um, from medical error, you can see that diagnostic errors are more common, and in fact, not shown here, but also more costly and definitely more harmful than treatment mistakes. We're very used to talking about medication errors um, and to some extent is because they are much easier to describe, but they are dwarfed by the presence of errors in diagnosis that lead to bad outcomes. Um, so let's think about us as diagnostic individuals. And studies of diagnostic error assign three main categories, really. No fault errors, system failures, and human cognitive error. Um, but if you look closely at human cognitive error, what do we find? We find knowledge gaps. Um, we find misinterpretation of diagnostic tests. And then we find cognitive errors and biases, errors in our reasoning and human mistakes that we're all predisposed to. Cognitive errors in reasoning account for two thirds of all of diagnostic errors, either on their own, 
or as part of a system related factor. Either available data was not adequately gathered or it was available but not synthesized correctly. So the major reason for mistakes, errors in medicine that result in harm is in fact cognitive error. It's our thinking and our reasoning. Um, this here reports um, the most frequently missed diagnoses amongst physician reported cases of diagnostic error. And you wouldn't be surprised to see pulmonary embolism, our, our tough nut uh, in, to crack right up at the top. And broadly, they can be classified as major vascular events, cancers, and infection. Okay, and well, and that's really no surprise because those are in fact the three big causes of disease we see in any way. So across those three medical error uh, presentations, that's where diagnostic errors happen. Uh, cognitive error is a failure, therefore, in rational or logical thought. And, and it's often due to biases or also called dispositions to respond. And about 50 known biases exist. They're universal, they're predictable, and importantly, they can be corrected. Um, you can call it cognitive debiasing. And, and here's one, which is overconfidence as we talk about diagnostics. This is an ICU study of 270 patients who died in ICU. And physicians were asked to rate their degree of certainty about the diagnosis. And you can see here they rated their certainty as either completely certain, minor uncertainty, or they really weren't sure, major uncertainty. And on post-mortem, this is the percentage of diagnosis were in fact correct. When a physician was completely certain of the diagnosis and the cause of death, therefore, in an ICU patient, they were in fact correct only 60% of the time. And from there on, it not got worse. Uh, and unfortunately, the actual percentage with fatal but potential treatable errors, given those diagnostic errors, was almost one in 10. Okay. Um, overconfidence, big characteristic of doctors, as expressed here by, by Sherlock Holmes. So Arthur Conan Doyle was a physician. But importantly, in the era of medical errors, um, malpractice, and legal <laughs> lawyers involved, um, this is probably still hold true. But Sherlock Holmes, he said, when a doctor does go wrong, he is the first of criminals. He has the nerve and he has the knowledge. I think that's pushing a little bit. So, so let me just uh, briefly divert into the theory of reasoning. And where do things go wrong? Um, so here's a case for you. Um, 50 year old man with a history of intravenous drug use and end stage renal disease presented with subacute fevers, was found to have sepsis, a new pan-systolic murmur at the apex, and Osler's nodes on examination. What's going on? Uh, and instantly, you have a diagnosis. Um, and that's pattern recognition, or a heuristic, also described as rules of thumb, best practices, common sense, it's intuitive judgment, inductive reasoning. Here's another case. A 50-year-old man presents with malaise and arthralgias. He's found to be pyrexial and have a tachycardia. What is going on here? And you can immediately see that you are pausing and you now require slow, deliberate thought to generate a differential diagnosis using frameworks of thinking that I'm gonna take you through in the second half of this talk. Um, but what I'm illustrating here is really the dual process theory of reasoning, which consists of two systems of reasoning. Um, and clinicians utilize both to correctly arrive at a diagnosis. First system is intuitive, um, system one, while the second system is analytical. In fact, evidence from functional MRI um, shows that distinct anatomical pathways are used when making decisions using these two systems that are quite separate. Um, and a careful balance between these two systems is necessary to ensure efficient and effective clinical reasoning. So, so, so pattern recognition is the FAST system. It's intuitive and it's often used by experts and it uses heuristics and it has problems, but it's not without its use. The important bit in these two systems is that one can move between them and a calibration step helps you to achieve correctness. And I'll show you that now. So system one is intuitive, heuristic, follows patterns, it's automatic, subconscious, it's fast and effortless. However, it has low or variable reliability, it's vulnerable to error. It's highly affected by the context 
It has high emotional involvement and low scientific rigor. Where system two is analytical, systematic, deliberate and conscious, it's slow and effortful. It has a high and consistent reliability because of that it's less prone to error, it's less affected by context or emotional involvement and it has high scientific rigor. Most of us live our lives using system one, for example, driving a car. I mean, can you imagine the cognitive effort involved if we always had to think about driving like we did in our first lesson? So after a while, driving becomes intuitive, automatic, subconscious. Uh, and in evolutionary terms, um, these, they're forms of decision making that are fast and shared, you know, with animals where speed is more important, accuracy, and those that are evolved system two are more distinctly human. Um, and if you, if you want to read uh, more about this, Daniel Kahneman, um, who is a psychologist and an economist and, and notable for his work on the psychology of judgment and decision-making, uh, he, he wrote this book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, and one of the theses that you'll see throughout and, and that I'm talking about is that we humans constantly fool ourselves by constructing flimsy accounts of the past and believing they are true. And, and system one thinking or heuristic thinking causes biases and errors uh, and overconfidence. Um, the, the areas of the brain required for system two processes are most affected by internal and external factors such as sleep deprivation and fatigue. And all these factors listed here um, combine to increase the use of system one processes and compromise system two process. So it's important to understand that internal external factors also has major effect on cognitive cognition and how you function. So let me just take you through a few examples of this. And um, so you become familiar with this. Uh, and, and these are not things that you're not familiar with, but it's helpful to give them words. Um, let's start with an experiment. So, so it probably works better in a lecture theater, but, but, but have a look at the sentence for a few seconds. Uh, how many F's are there? Um, right, you can't, you can't put up your hand and I'm not going to ask for comments here, but, but, but knowing, uh, having done this in a, in a big group of people, there's likely a spread of answers. Two, three, what did you find? Four, five. Here it is again. Um, and there's six F's. <laughs> here they're highlighted. So, so what's interesting about this is, of course, everyone here is smart. Everyone can read English. We're all looking at the same thing. Uh, and this is how the human brain works. That, that V sound of the letter F in of tricked people's brains to thinking there were less Fs than they actually are. And if you got the correct answer, don't be smug. Um, try this one. Have a quick look at this problem. See what answer you can come up with. A bat and a ball cost one rand ten in total. The bat costs one rand more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Okay, and, and if you've come up with what most people do, which is 10 cents, you used your intuition, type one thinking, and you're wrong. Uh, the answer is five cents. Uh, and you can work that out afterwards. So, so what's going on here? Uh, really, these are human factors. To err is human. Uh, and these are intuitive, Type one thinking, I'm not giving you time to work out the answer. Uh, and unfortunately, a large proportion of you listening would have got it wrong. So cognitive biases are subconscious errors. They lead to perceptual distortion, inaccurate judgment, and illogical interpretation of information. And it's very prevalent in everyday life. To err is human. Uh, and cognitive biases fall into four main groups. Social biases is classic peer group pressure, the halo effect. You know, someone is good at one thing, so you assume they're good at everything. Um, memory biases, hindsight significantly impairs our ability to judge the quality of decision making that occurred in the past. Decision making biases, I'm going to show you now, and probability biases, uh, I'm also going to show you a little bit now. So, so, so here's a few common ones, and you'll recognize these. Um, occurring all the time. So anchoring bias is also called premature closure. It's the failure to continue considering reasonable alternatives after a primary diagnosis is reached. And it's the most common diagnostic error. And it's, it's one of the most common reasons registrars fail the clinical component of their fellowship examination. Uh, when the diagnosis is made, the thinking stops. 
Okay. Um, availability and confirmation bias, very common. Availability bias is you judge things more likely if they come to mind. Uh, sometimes it explains the rare diagnosis coming threes kind of scenario. Uh, and confirmation bias is the tendency to look for confirming evidence to support a theory, uh, rather than look for contradictory evidence to refute it, even if the latter is clearly present. That's really uh, the scientific method. It's common when you're seeing a patient who's already been seen by another doctor, who, especially if they're more senior than you. Uh, and of course, confirmation bias is rife in everyday life. People read newspapers that already support their views. You know, they browse internet sites and Twitter that mirror their own values. They hang out with like-minded people. Okay. And again, Sherlock Holmes said it best. It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. Diagnostic momentum, <laughs> very common in our system where patients are referred to Kruski Hospital, the tendency for a particular diagnosis to stick despite a lack of supporting evidence. Um, and, and it tends to become stickier as it's passed with increased certainty from person to person, from the wife who said, um, my husband had chest pain and I think he had a heart attack to the nurse that says the patient came in with chest pain and a heart attack to the casualty doctor who presents the patient with a heart attack to the registrar who admits the patient with a heart attack, et cetera. Yeah. And of course, also from admission to admission. And as I want to emphasize how important history taking is, the unpacking principle is the failure to elicit all relevant information to establish a diagnosis. So a package is handed to you and you just don't unwrap it. You don't grow, go into any depth. Um, Visceral bias um, is counter-transference, so it's negative feelings towards a patient may result in diagnosis being missed. Important for us to acknowledge this. Common types, non-adherent patients, homeless patients, that patient with chronic pain, you know, obese patients. Uh, and again, um, Sherlock Holmes in The Sign of Four said that the emotional qualities are antagonistic to clear reason. Important for us to recognize that. Uh, and then probability pitfalls of common biases. Um, and, and one can, um, I'll discuss one or two of those, but you can spot these often in presentations. You know, the, uh, the patient didn't meet the criteria, but, you know, that's an aggregate bias. It doesn't apply to my patient. Or, or, or somebody who presents rare diagnoses high on the list or, or has a tendency to do lots and lots of tests. That's base rate neglect. Uh, or if they present comments about probability, you know, in, it's, it's unusual for us to, to see the same sequence of diseases. I've just admitted the fourth patient, et cetera. These, these are all clues to this being part of uh, diagnostic mistakes that are being made. Basinate rate neglect is very important. I'm going to discuss it a few times. Um, and and we, we, we're very familiar with it uh, in the COVID era, uh, of course. Um, uh, shown here is hospitalized patients with COVID, the unvaccinated and the vaccinated. Uh, and clearly in the hospital sample, they are more vaccinated than unvaccinated people in the hospital. So vaccines, in fact, might even be harmful, not protective. But, but um, in, you know, the, the background rate in the population or the prevalence is being ignored. So if you look at the total vaccinated population, versus the unvaccinated population and those with hospitalized with COVID, it's very clear in this little diagram to see that the hospitalization rate is five times higher in unvaccinated populations, so 50% of them versus 10%. In clinical diagnostic terms, um, rate neglect ignores prevalence. And it's a common mistake in juniors, for example, to assume that two diseases that present similarly are equally likely to be present. Uh, you know, and it's a simple explanation why tuberculosis, which could present like many diseases, pretty much always close, close or on top of our differential diagnosis list. And again, I'm going to discuss that briefly when I go through the process. So, so the, the human brain is wired to jump to conclusions, to see patterns that don't exist, to miss things that are obvious. And our estimate of probability is also poor. Um, and again, I can recommend this book by Ralph Dobelli, 
um, the art of thinking clearly, where the, the thesis is again system one error. Um, and, you know, th that's perhaps not entirely true when it comes to expert reasoning, but it's an important thesis and a very easy to read book. Bias should be considered a normal operating characteristic of the human brain. You know, biases are everywhere and they have the potential to influence almost every decision we make. Uh, and so Jane's reason here of medical errors really made this comment, which I think is very important. Good doctors are not those who don't make mistakes. Good doctors are those who expect to make mistakes and act on that, that expectation. And with that as a background, um, in the second half of this talk, I'm going to take you through diagnostic reasoning deconstructed uh, and, and give you a framework um, for novices. Um, some might appeal to the students and some which might be helpful for the teachers here. Uh, and I've already alluded um, to this, uh, these key elements as described uh, in a very widely referenced article from the New England Journal of Medicine in 2006. Um, but I'm going to use this framework um, to take you through the process. And uh, you, you'll, you'll see that this has just recently been published. Um, it's the five C's. Uh, it gives you a simple framework uh, that you can use to teach uh, and for students to follow. Um, I like the pictures, um, but unable to give you the actual publication yet. So it still says accepted across the front. So if you'll excuse me about that. And let me just take you through this framework. There are various frameworks. The language is not always the same. I think there's still uncertainty about how best to approach this problem, but they all follow more or less the same pattern. And this is the framework of diagnostic reasoning. The first is collect. Um, data collection. Okay, clinicians explore the patient's history and exam to generate a problem representation, your initial problem representation which is a synthesis of the defining clinical features of the case. And um, we, we, we taught students from a very young age how to collect data, you know, initial data, history of preventing illness, review of symptoms, so you don't miss anything, past histories, uh, good focused physical exam, and then we add tests to that. And this is almost certainly the most important part of diagnostic reasoning. Um, uh, this was said by Sherlock Holmes, but I think Prof. Jill Ainsley, uh, <laughs> In the respiratory clinic could have said exactly the same thing to the registrars who are presenting cases to her data 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 he cried impatiently i can't make bricks without clay um, and uh, one of my favorite detectives harry bosch said this i've learned over the years that sometimes if you ask the same question more than once you get different responses when you watch post intake ward rounds um, you, you'll see that consultants who are trying to verify or assist with making a diagnosis on a patient mostly repeat and take histories uh, on the ward run again. Far less would they examine a patient um, to confirm or refute clinical signs. Uh, important that history is an iterative process. As the diagnostic process evolves and other clues appear, one returns to the bedside and asks further questions. I think a very common mistake in, in you know, the 30 minute short case college exam is, uh, is the same mistake that students make, is you start with a history, then you move to the examination, and then you run out of time. Um, important to, to mention that expert diagnosticians generally make a diagnosis within the first three to five minutes, okay? And you can see how much easier an iterative process then becomes. That's particularly difficult, I think, for novices. Um, and, and, you know, everybody's aware of, um, <laughs> You know, the patient providing a different answer to the to the physician the morning after admission to the frustration of everybody who clocked them the night before. So taking history is the most important part uh, of making a diagnosis. Uh, but I'm talking about reasoning, so I'm not going to talk too much about the detail. Uh, examination is important. Um, you know, many technologies like ultrasound, echo, and CT have replaced parts of the physical exam because they can reveal internal structures and function, but there really is no substitute for inspecting a person. It's a foundational clinical skill that requires deliberate attention, a focus on detail, a curious attitude, and lots of practice. Um, 
and 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 clinicians will be very well aware that this is exactly what you tell your medical students what Sherlock Holmes observed here you see but you do not observe the distinction is clear we then have to generate uh, the initial problem representation so just just a few tips around this the, the, what this is is the transformation of a patient's problems into abstract terms uh, and the, the student must synthesize the history into a cohesive summary so a student might say that this is a painful swollen right knee that began two nights ago with attacks two and nine years ago but what we really want them to say is that the patient has acute recurrent attacks of abrupt nocturnal severe pain in a large joint monoarthritis um, and there's a little formula that's helpful to develop um, the problem representation which should almost always be given only in two sentences and um, pithy uh, is the most important concept here the age and gender highly relevant past medical history to the diagnosis description of the primary symptom using semantic qualifiers and then highly relevant diagnostic data using clinical syndromes when possible so, so, so let me just sh show you a little bit what I mean by that. So semantic qualifiers are paired opposites, acute, chronic, sharp, dull, bilateral, unilateral, constant, intermittent, proximal, distal, at rest with activity. And again, senior clinicians do this automatically, yeah. Um, but, but you'll find that in your junior students who are still learning, um, this is a very helpful concept for them to understand. So, so, so if you look at a problem representation without semantic qualifiers, sometimes it's chest pain or shortness of breath or headache, but with semantic qualifiers, with paired opposites, you really um, develop the problem, which will then help you get onto the next step much more accurately. So chest pain can be described as acute onset, severe crushing chest pain at rest, or shortness of breath is chronic shortness of breath with walking. Okay, and then, and then secondly, we expect um, that presentations of the problem um, is presented using clinical syndromes whenever possible, a collection of signs and symptoms attributed to the same cause. So, so if you have confusion, a temperature of 39, a heart rate of 120, a blood pressure of 130 over 60, respiratory rate of 24, white cells of 16, and positive blood culture, you have severe sepsis. Yeah, the patient presents with severe sepsis. So if you have jaundice, ascites, confusion, asterisks, and iron of two, the patient presents with acute hepatic failure. So, so, so that's very important to synthesize the problem in that way before you move to the next step. And again, this is um, something that one can explicitly therefore examine and teach uh, in junior levels, at fourth year level, where in fact the next step, which is developing a differential diagnosis, is, is, is actually the next step and, and more difficult. Um, next, we connect. Um, so we search for matching illness scripts uh, and using that we initiate develop an initial differential diagnosis so, so illness scripts uh, is a widely used term that not really used in south africa um, but i think it's perhaps a helpful term because these are knowledge structures used to store and organize really the clinical features pathophysiology and risk factors for given disease and and uh, clinicians develop and refine illness scripts with experience over time and, and in fact they're stored in your head um, you, you may develop it on a piece of paper as you're learning but they're in your head and and actually if you ask an experienced clinician they have a multitude of illness scripts and um, perhaps a complete book sometimes uh, and you match these illness scripts automatically um, either through pattern recognition or through slow deliberate analysis and then you develop a, a differential diagnosis so so there's there's three steps um, the first is to represent the problem that I've discussed. The second one is that you that you can then use diagnostic schemas uh, or what we refer to as approaches or approach to. If the problem the patient presents with acute painful monoarthritis, what is my approach to acute painful monoarthritis? You know? Or what is my approach to arthritis? Uh, is it you know, single joint? Is it multiple joint? Is it inflammatory? Is it non-inflammatory? Is it acute? Is it chronic, et cetera? So you can have a diagnostic schema and it may be developed as an algorithm or not. And, and then those link you into illness scripts. So, so illness scripts are very simple, as I said, summaries, usually using these six uh, categories. And, and um, you can make these on a one page summaries and you can get a whole lot of them on the internet if you're a student. And it's a very helpful way to link problems with um, and, and book knowledge. 
so, so there's an illness script, for example, for a patient with gout, um, for, for, for gout. So epidemiology is male, age over 50, alcohol use, prior gout, loop diuretics, high period infusion of chronic kidney disease, pathophysiology is listed there, symptoms, physical exam, workup, and treatment. And then in this, it's important to think about defining features. These are features that are typical of a disease. It's monoarticular, the first MTP, most common, et cetera. Of discriminating features. So systemic symptoms are usually absent in gout versus septic arthritis, for example, which helps you discriminate from others. And pathognomonic features, which can be clinical, um, clinical signs, you know, pulses paradoxus in a patient with heart failure or, or, or um, uh, or diagnostic, you know, so here negative bifringent monosodium urate crystals uh, on a joint aspiration. Uh, and using the script, you can then um, link uh, various problems with the illness scripts to come up with a differential diagnosis. Okay, so, 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 so strategies to make a differential diagnosis, and I, I really um, want to give credit and refer. Um, anybody actually to Rahul Patwadri's YouTube channel, who's got the most beautiful 15 minute, minute videos on uh, clinical reasoning. Um, I, th I think there's about 14 of them um, that takes you through this process, uh, really directed at undergraduate uh, level. But, but it's helpful to think about the strategies to make a differential diagnosis very quickly. You know, what is most probable? You know, in my office, I mostly see asthma as a cause of shoulder root. That's very helpful. And you can go to a list and say, well, I've looked it up. And actually, the four most commonest causes is asthma, pneumonia, COPD, and MI or heart attack for shortness of breath. So, so, so that's how I come up with it. Very importantly, uh, what can I not miss? You know, if you work in the emergency room, um, if I miss pulmonary embolus or heart attack or tension pneumothorax as a cause of shoulder effect, then the patient can rapidly die. So that is immediately done to the top of the differential. Um, we use mnemonics. Um, you know, here's one called Vindicate, vascular, inflammatory, etc. And, you know, when you look at shoulder breath, you can come up with a diagnosis in each of those categories. And if you're stuck, then, uh, and if you're a junior and clinician use anatomic inner frameworks. What in the chest can cause trouble breathing? Could it be the heart? Could it be the lungs? Could it be the airways, the alveoli, the vessels, pulmonary embolus, or the blood, etc.? Or when you can use physiologic frameworks, how does dyspnea work? Um, well, you know, dyspnea is caused by hypoxia, hypercapnia, acidemia. There's your DKA as a cause of dyspnea or central. So these are all helpful frameworks. The expert clinician. Uh, you can see he's got glasses in his gray there. So the, the expert clinician goes, oh, I've seen this before. This is congestive heart failure. I feel it in my gut. Um, and, and they can really very quickly recognize uh, the diagnosis. Um, look, looks to a, a junior clinician like magic. Um, but that's really heuristics. Uh, and to be fair, the expert clinician actually also has a backup and uses all the other frameworks for developing differential diagnosis as well. It doesn't just stop there. The next step is to calibrate. Um, and, and this is important. This is to compare, contrast, and to, as I've said before, think about cognitive biases. So it's a metacognitive thinking about thinking checkpoint. Um, where you reflect on your thought processes and you mitigate biases and predisposition thinking that can lead to error. So, so, so it's, uh, it's talk, take, take a diagnostic time out is really the most uh, helpful comment. Stop, pause, think about how you, you have been thinking uh, and then move on. And, and in that way, you develop a prioritized and a different differential diagnosis. Uh, and then we confirm uh, which you can collect additional data uh, and test your hypothesis. Uh, and this data may not only be lab tests, but can be any other tests or it can be clinical features or historical features as well. Uh, and important at this concept is that you apply pertinent positive and negative findings to the framework um, that you've decided on. Uh, as Sherlock Holmes noted in the 1800s, is there any point to which you would wish to draw my attention? To the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. The dog did nothing in the nighttime. That was the curious incident, remarks Sherlock Holmes. The negatives 
uh, are often, if not uh, as helpful as the positives. Uh, and again, I'm not going to have a lot of time, but I'm going to just show you briefly what I mean. Um, that, that part of hypothesis testing is iterative Bayesian thinking, which really means we're incorporating um, prevalence or prior probability and the specificity of the findings to connect conditional probabilities uh, into the differential diagnosis. Okay, and, and it's iterative, we do it over and over again. So, so, so differential diagnosis is not that mathematically precise. And um, you can, you know, we classify it sometimes using these words, very likely, likely, uncertain, unlikely, you know, and your diagnosis might sit there in the 45%. That's sort of what I know. Uh, and then you can refine that diagnosis and where you fit it in. And it, it depends on, on the patient and the disease. So the greater the match between your data and your disease illness scripts, the more likely the diagnosis. If there are key pathognomonic features of the diagnosis, uh, then the diagnosis is very lateral. Um, or it has rejecting features uh, and it makes the diagnosis really very unlikely. So, 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 so this is a clinical estimate, um, which is really entirely experience dependent. But the most fundamental principle in clinical decision making at this point is that the interpretation of new information depends on what you believe beforehand, and that includes clinical information. Um, and, and I say belief that this means on the basis of a good history examination and reasoning. Um, so, so the interpretation of a test results depends on the probability of the disease before the test. And, and, and again, that test might be a clinical test or it could be a laboratory test or something else. And, you really need good medical knowledge of how diseases present, plus the epidemiology to estimate the pre-test probability. Um, and yeah, once you accept this principle, your life will never be the same again. I mean, tests are really widely misused by clinicians. Um, and, and tests have to be interpreted. Tests don't make a diagnosis, doctors do. So, so positive tests, you know, and you can say the inverse, raise the probability that that is the likely diagnosis. Okay, negative tests can do the opposite and one test can sometimes do both. But here's just an exercise to illustrate, stimulate your thought um, of what I mean. So if a test to detect a disease whose prevalence is one in a thousand has a false positive rate of 5%, what is the chance that a person found to have a positive result actually has the disease? Again, I'm assuming you know nothing about the person's symptoms and signs. So, so there's a person in front of you um, the, the disease that you think he has has a prevalence of one in a thousand. The test you're running has a false positive rate of five percent. Okay, and um, uh, lots of very smart people say ninety-five percent, but but here's the answer. Okay, so so false positives are five percent, fifty in a thousand, but only one in a thousand actually has the disease. So it means the chance of a positive result with disease is actually 2%, okay? Uh, and this concept really is crucial to, um, in other words, the importance of understanding prevalence of the denominator is absolutely crucial in diagnostic reasoning, whether it comes to clinical reasoning or whether it comes to tests. Uh, and really a test result by itself is not the answer. Um, I must say, unfortunately patients all, for that matter, my family, really don't know this or understand this at all. Tests must be interpreted in the light of clinical probability. And, um, you know, what do you think is the diagnosis before you run the tests completely changes the outcome of that test. You must also know something about the characteristics of the test in question. And, and if the prevalence of the disease is very high or very low, uh, this very significantly affects the predictive value of the tests as I've shown you there. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we commit or continue. So we select um, a diagnosis, or often it's a working diagnosis, because there may be a revision all the way through, or, or, or ongoing investigations. And, and of course, that may be recalibrated based on treatment response or other items that become available over time. Uh, and just one last concept is that um, we develop treatment and testing thresholds um, in our head. Um, so, so, you know, we recognize that there's only a 90% chance that we are right, but at that level, we are happy that that patient is within the treatment threshold and we will rule in the diagnosis and we will treat it. And, and similarly, we somewhat arbitrarily might have 
a rule out threshold to say this patient has a less than 30% chance of having the di this diagnosis and we will reject the diagnosis. And whether you reject it depends a lot on how serious the disease is. You might not reject certain diseases that have major impact on patients, whereas others you won't. Uh, and tests in general, um, whether they're laboratory or any other tests, their most value is in this middle component. That, that's true for all kinds of tests. So if the probability of the disease is in the middle, then it's worthwhile running a test. Otherwise, tests fail you on both ends. The classic, for example, stress tests in somebody with chest pain. If, if they have either a high or low probability of coronary disease, the test is reasonably useless. And then lastly, um, I just want to bring up this concept of understanding and communicating uncertainty in achieving diagnostic excellence and, and being open and honest about it, I think is incredibly helpful for juniors when they see seniors expressing uncertainty. Uh, and diagnostic uncertainty should be shared. It should be shared explicitly with patients, as difficult as that is. For failure to communicate uncertainty contributes to diagnostic error, okay, if we pretend to be certain that we're not. Uh, and, and understanding uncertainty can be enriched by incorporating other perspectives, social sciences, humanities, etc. It should be reimagined as positive and routinely embraced in clinical care and education. Um, it, it's, it's a concept that just doesn't seem familiar to, to many. Um, and explicitly acknowledging, managing, and communicating uncertainty promotes diagnostic safety culture. It's really important for us to, to understand that. So, so I really, I hope that I've given you the framework and the language to understand your own diagnostic reasoning process and, and hence to convey that to others. I'm gonna finish um, with a checklist for diagnosis. Seeing the checklists um, in other contexts have been shown to save lives, obtain your own complete medical history. Performed a focused and a purposeful physical examination. Generate some initial hypotheses and differentiate the, those with appropriate additional questions, exam or tests, go back. Okay. Pause to reflect, take your diagnostic time out of something I wanted to focus on in this talk. Was I comprehensive? Did I consider the inherent flaws of heuristic thinking? Was my judgment affected by other biases? Do I need to make the diagnosis now? Or can I wait? And what's the worst case scenario? What are the do not miss entities? Yeah, this pause to reflection, this component has not been validated as being helpful, but the thought of that that's really the difference between um, an everyday diagnostician and an expert diagnostician. And then embark on a plan, but acknowledge uncertainty and ensure a pathway for follow-up, a checklist for diagnosis. And I'll leave the last word to um, Gosha Ayoma, who's the writer of actually the, the most widely consumed fictional detective, Conan, who's a manga comic uh, circulating more than any other and read more than any other detective story in the world. Detectives are only human. We're not gods that know everything. When detectives tell their theory, in reality, most are rather anxious, thinking that there's always possibility that they could have missed something somewhere. But in return, the excitement you experience when your theory is smack bang correct is twice as great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, Peter, for, for that uh, thought-provoking and, and wide-ranging uh, conceptual overview of this, this really key issue. Uh, in all of our work, and it was really great talk. So thanks very much. I uh, just, um, if if people have questions, just raise your hand or, or type them in the chat. Peter, if if I can ask the first question, and that's just really uh, around the issue of of diagnostic error and how we deal with it um, in as as a medical community, because I know that you know it's been written about you know in the uh, pilot community how. People, you know, go out of their way to um, pick up on errors and um, and highlight them and and use them in opportunities for learning. And there's there's, there's a a process for doing that. And perhaps in medication errors, we have that in place. But how do we go about um, sort of using diagnostic errors as an opportunity for learning and actually discussing them rather than kind of pushing them under the carpet? <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know, Graham, I guess that's the point of, of M&M reviews in its classic sense. You know, it's mm -hmm. no fault 
um, open forums where we review mistakes that we made and we acknowledge them and, and we learn from them. The, the, at, you know, finding the patient with a diagnostic error and someone actually claiming ownership of that is unbelievably difficult. We have pride in our diagnosis and we don't acknowledge that we make these mistakes. So, so, so you might find somebody else's mistake when you see the patient again. And, and I challenge all of you, how often have you gone to your colleague and say, hey, you made a mistake? You know, <laughs> what, what happened? Yeah, I think it's, you know, finding those stories and reviewing them are, are, are difficult, but that's the only way to do it. I, I mean, I, I did mention throughout the talk that we should acknowledge uh, first and foremost, that, that we do make mistakes. All humans do. Uh, and, and the best way to learn is to learn from our mistakes. I mean, there, there's no question, and we need a mechanism to do that. I, I think an M&M forum is, is the right mechanism. Um, and and uh, although we haven't had any <laughs> during COVID for so long, I must say, generally, I enjoy them very well when they run in the right spirit of, of learning uh, from our mistakes. Yeah. Mm. But, but how we pick up on them is, is very difficult. I mean, a, a, most of diagnostic error mistakes are picked up by folder review. <laughs> in general that, that's yeah. how people find them yeah. yeah you know that's how the research is done as well it's almost always yeah. done by folder review um <laughs> rather than by someone standing up and acknowledging the mistakes so yeah and, and peter i mean just a, probably a related issue is, is do you think that the way we make medical notes um you know it's somehow um actually feeds into the potential for error in the sense that you know sometimes yes. We're not 100 percent sure of a diagnosis, yet we write the the, the diagnosis yes. down. One hundred percent. Writing the diagnosis with a probability um, or, or some sense yeah. of that it's it's a it's it's not a that the, the probability associated with it rather than a certainty. One 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 hundred percent. Yeah, I, I, and and again, unfortunately, as much as we hate this, we should acknowledge that that something simple like writing notes we do very badly and pilots do it much better. And, and as much as we hate to acknowledge that, it should be standardized. So, and there are attempts to standardize even diagnostic certainty. So, so, so you know, you, you can, you know, what, what is probable, what is possible and what is definite, for example. So, you know, and what, what percentage of likelihood would you give that so that your peers and people who follow on you can follow your reasoning, et cetera. So I think there are, there are mechanisms to do that. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, everybody except doctors, you know, everybody does it better than doctors. That's, that's the, bottom, the bottom line. I think we like thinking more than we like writing. So, um, but, but we are very poor at, at expressing what we think in the notes and, and the mechanism of how you write is, is poor and should be structured. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and it's amazing, you know, every single hospital writes notes in their own way, you know, like you go everywhere and there's just no standardized structured mm -hmm. method to write notes and of course the mm. lawyers love it i mean you know it's mm. very hard for us to protect ourselves if we don't write yeah well yeah so, so yeah i think there's another there's another project and talk yeah yeah you know just when we write the diagnostic list that we just say that we're not certain of this and yeah. and this is what uh these are the probability that this is the most likely but yeah, no, but uh it's still no, no, to be it's post, post intake ward round professor mm. mankey's colon you know <laughs> Heart failure, line, and it doesn't does not convey any you know, the, yeah. and, and again, as I've shown before, that's exactly the the, the sticky error that then just persists yeah. all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so I just want to encourage others to ask questions or to share thoughts um, uh, on on this topic um, or experiences. Um, just some of the the feedback in the chat was. Uh, this was really useful for me uh, as a student. Thank you so much. And then there was a question about will the recording be available? And we have recorded it and, and uh, had to discuss with Pete about making that available. It's certainly be made available to our students if, if, with Pete's uh, approval. Um, and then Estelle writes, awesome lecture. These definitions and approaches are necessary tools that deserve to be as close to us as, a, as the stethoscope. Um, so that, you, you know, just um, really uh, positive feedback from the talk. I don't see any hands um, up, and um, so if there's nobody else asking questions, um, Peter, then I can just ask you. I mean, just practically on on a a, a, a ward round, uh, assuming that uh, it's not a forty patient ward round, and you have uh, some time for discussion of these topics, 
how do you practically share your approach to uh, reasoning through a difficult diagnosis with registrars and, and students? Um, Graham, I think, you know, and, and, and the colleagues on here will, will immediately recognize when I say that we can gain incredible insight from um, listening to other people's presentations. Uh, and, uh, and we need to force those presentations to have one of two introductions in two sentences. The first one is at very, very junior level. So let's say our fourth year um, who are just starting the block, et cetera, we need to force them to introduce every single patient with a problem representation of two sentences, as I've described, yeah. And you will immediately gain insight into um, their knowledge, uh, as well as their integration of knowledge into recognizing what's important and what's not important. And, and then as you move on to a higher level, uh, we should insist and force that every single presentation, whether it's post clinical or clinical patient by a registrar, starts with a two-line clinical assessment, which focuses on a diagnosis uh, and may include at the end a differential diagnosis. So, uh, and I think you can gain immediate insight um, into their understanding uh, and reasoning of the case um, following on that. And, and, and that gives you a... a a way into discussing, discussing reasoning. There are many trigger questions that you can ask, um, you know, why did you think of this? Why did you think that's important versus that, et cetera, to, 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 to focus on reasoning as a component of the teaching round, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us do that. Um, you know, we, we, we probably enjoy that actually, and, 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 and it's enjoyable, but, but it's, it's helpful to have a structure uh, and as we examine students, I think it's very helpful to, to have a consensus about a structure, actually, that this mm -hmm. is how we do and teach and that students actually know what's expected of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so yeah, just to say, uh, Pete, uh, you know, thanks very much once again for, for a really excellent talk. And, and um, you know, I think, I think it's, a, it's a topic and an issue that, that um, we should continue to engage on. And, um, you know, I, I think because it's so core to our activity uh, in terms of the work that we do, um, that that you know perhaps uh, in a year's time or so we could we could have another session on this topic um, and and just encourage a discussion and, and thought around uh, the process of diagnostic reasoning and reflection on it. So, but thanks thanks very much, Pete. Uh, just to say that um, Craig Simons had, had sent me a message to ask about CPD points. Uh, we haven't put the link up today, but we will be able to get the people that attended uh, from, from the Zoom uh, a download, and we will be in contact to make sure that CPD points are accredited uh, for, 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 for this, this afternoon's lecture. So thanks very much, Pete, and, and thanks everybody for attending. Cheers. Thanks, everyone.